Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Ethical Leadership Program. Andrea Bowman and I will be talking to you today about. I'm Jody Bruins. I'm Leadership and Civic Engagement Specialist with NDSU Extension. And I'm Andrea Bowman. I also work for NDSU Extension in Leadership and Civic Engagement and work with the LEAD Local Program. Yeah, so what brings us here today is um, may, you may be familiar with our leadership program called LEAD Local. And we've done this with many groups across the state of North Dakota, many organizations and businesses. And um, one particular piece that we're going to cover today is that on um, ethical leadership. And even though it's a small section of this particular program, it seems to be the one that gets the most discussion, um, questions, and antidotes in regards to ethical leadership in regards to either business or those in leadership positions. So. Um, we hope you gain something from this, and um, it always leads to some good discussion in your organization. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about um, the open record and meeting laws. We'll highlight those laws and also um, what it means to be an ethical leader and just some best practices for your organization um, to show transparency. So some rationalizations that we've heard people talk about when we do this program. You know, what, how do people rationalize unethical behavior? Sometimes it's um, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, as long as my decisions don't hurt anyone, it must be okay. Um, or I've got it coming, they owe me, it's a good cause. Um, so victim mentality, if it's necessary, it's ethical. Um, not necessarily, everyone else is doing it. So the age old adage, right? If you jumped off a bridge, would would, if you're, all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you too? Um, and finally, it's a dumb rule. And maybe some laws you might consider dumb, but they're there to protect people and organizations. So um, even though it may not make much sense to you, um, ethical leadership um, is proven to lead to a better workplace and a more robust organization. And it's really why we talk about ethical leadership is so people don't have to take the time to make these rationalizations. You know, ethical leadership um, is really leadership that demonstrates uh, respect for ethics and values. And you want those ethics and values to be part of your organization and what your organization stands for. So it's really um, why this discussion is important. And I think people, it's not always a discussion that organizations have. So we really want to make sure that organizations take the time to recognize what their ethics and values are. So I included this particular cartoon because I think it gets right to the point of the matter. So um, probably familiar with Dilbert. This is the Dilbert cartoon by Scott Adams. And so I acted ethically and emailed Scott Adams for permission to be able to use this for the program. Um, and so the cartoon reads like this. Have you taken the mandatory training for business ethics? No, but if you say I did, then you'll have some money on training, save some money on training, which you can spend to decorate your office. Well, luckily I haven't taken the training myself. I hear it's mostly common sense anyway. So when we talk about ethics, it seems like your ethics and my ethics may not align. And so, like Andrea said, it's important to be talking about it as an organization. So what I might think is ethical, um, if we don't talk about it, we might be divided in, in, um, in our ethical decision making. So it has to be a culture, an organizational culture. So character is really ethics in action. Um, it's what you do when, it's how you behave when you think no one is looking. Um, and we, we have a lot of examples of when we talk about this, you know, that yellow, that yellow light. Um, I think a, a really common one lately is when you're driving and your phone is buzzing, you're lighting up, you know, it's, you've got, you've got that text waiting and the urge to read it is really strong, but you know, you're driving and you need to focus on the road. And so it's really important to, um, walk the walk and talk the talk. I think, um, when we talk about character and ethics in action it's um there's a lot of parallels to parenting um you know there's always there's always eyes watching you 
So I think that's an important concept when it comes to ethical leadership and leading a group. If you wouldn't want your family to see it on the front page of the newspaper, don't do it. You know, and we also recognize that we're all human and we make mistakes and those are going to happen. But I think it's it's how we handle those mistakes also um, and just owning up to them and being honest about about what we've done. So how do you practice ethical leadership? It's having a clear framework or an ethical mission. Um, so ethics can be um, really centered around respect for ethics, values, as well as rights and dignity of others. Um, it means that a work environment is governed by fair, clear articulated set of rules rather than by personality or politics. It should definitely be a topic of discussion. If your organization or business work of place, work of place of work, excuse me, is not discussing ethics, um, it can be left up to interpretation. Ethical thought should be connected to ethical actions. So as Andrea stated before, walking the walk and talking the talk. And ethical leadership surely is a shared process. And I think it's important to just remember that the leader of an organization can really have a huge impact on, on how that um, organization is, is run and, and how it's perceived. So Jody, as we travel across the state, we've been into several communities now um, with our Lead Local program and had a lot of very um, meaningful discussions um, with different organizations and or participants from different organizations, I should say. And with that, um, there's a lot of questions asked. Um, do you want to start us off with maybe uh, one of the most common questions that people ask? Right. So it never fails. It seems like every time we do lead local, there's questions about public participation in meetings. And people always seem to be surprised at the fact that just because you attend a public meeting doesn't mean you have the, um, the right to be heard. So um, let's say I... I'm, I would like to participate in a county commission meeting or a school board meeting or any um, public meeting, okay? And so I show up and I have a, a problem with the road and I want to speak. Does the county commission have to grant me permission? Do they, do they have to allow me to talk, Andrea? They, they don't have to let you talk and this is where we get into the I'd like to call it the layers of ethical leadership or ethical organizations and um, so the loss is that you don't have to let um, people speak at a public meeting um, but best practice is to let citizens have their voice heard so legally you don't have to let people speak at the meeting but it's a it's a good practice to have to let the public have their voice be heard but with that said, it's always important to have some parameters um, for people to follow some guidelines. You know, typically they have to um, request to be the, on the agenda ahead of time and also have some parameters that they have to follow as they only have a certain amount of time to speak and will only, only speak when, when they're called on. So I'll reference um, the Office of the Attorney General. This is the North Dakota Attorney General. And it's the open meetings guide. And so I'll just read what it states about um, participation in public meetings. A member of the public has the right to attend an open meeting to record or broadcast the meeting, but does not have the right to speak. So as Andrea said, it's best practice if you wanna um, be heard at a meeting to call the county auditor or your business manager or whatever the point of contact is for that particular organization and ask to be put on the agenda and hope that you can be heard. Um, and so if there's a large contingent that shows up for a particular meeting, um, the county commission or whomever the governing body is, um, this is where it's important to use Robert rules of order and parliamentary procedure so you can, you have the right to limit times people are spoken and how many times they can speak. So if that's a particular issue, but again, that's pretty rare. Um, but it is important to follow those rules and ask to be on the agenda. And then I'm quite confident that you would be given the opportunity to be heard. But 
you do not have the legal right to be heard at a public meeting. All right. Thanks, Jody. And that, that leads me into another question that comes up a lot, and that's about um, noticing meetings and the agenda for the meeting. So people know that there's something at the meeting that, that interests them. And one of the questions um, that we often get is, you know, how far in advance does a meeting have to be noticed? And uh, organizations that have um, set meetings monthly typically have um, a system in place where they're not noticing, um, you know, the newspaper well in advance, um, their, their website, uh, the front door of the building has the notice of the meeting well in advance. Um, where this changes a little bit is when we get into special meetings, and those have been happening um, a little bit more frequently at the changing times um, in, our, in our state, in our nation. And so those special meetings, um, they need to be noticed as well, but those special meetings are noticed as soon as the date and time and agenda is set for the meeting. So there's not necessarily a set amount of time that needs to, um, the, the meeting needs to be noticed, but just as soon as, as that special meeting is set. And this has come yes. at several at several of our lead local trainings where people are, are confident that they have to let the newspaper or the TV station know two weeks in advance before the meeting. Well, again, I will reference the Attorney General's Office Meeting Guide. So meeting notices, prior written notice is required for all meetings of a public entity, including committees and subcommittees. Generally, there is no minimum advance notice period for public meetings. Okay, so an entity must provide public notice of the date, time, and location of the meeting when the governing body is notified. So just like Andrea said, um, it's a good practice to post the agenda as soon as an entity realizes they need to have a meeting. Um, so they'll post that outside of the meeting place. Perhaps it's on a door or window um, outside the office of, let's say, the business manager at the school. Um, if there's enough time, I know when, let's, again, I'll reference a county commission meeting. They, they meet every two weeks on a particular Monday morning. Um, the newspaper is waiting for that agenda and notice to be posted in the newspaper. But again, if there happens to be a special meeting, which there seems to be a lot of those right now, um, as long as you make um, a valiant effort to let the public um, know, perhaps that's on social media, um, or posting outside of the business place. Um, it's just good practice. In most cases, people don't mean to break the law, but if you can be as transparent as possible, then there's never any um, chance for people to question your motives. Yeah, I, I heard a really, um, I think, powerful statement the other day. Someone said, you know, we just appreciate when organizations communicate a lot, because when we when we don't get communication from them and we feel like they're hiding something, we feel like they're doing something wrong. And, and oftentimes organizations aren't even trying to do anything wrong. Um, they just aren't communicating what they're doing with people. And so people get nervous when they don't know what's happening. Right. Even if you don't mean to be doing anything wrong or you have nothing to hide. You know, if it's left up to interpretation, if you're not being clear with the public, what, what are they thinking? So mm -hmm. it's best to be as transparent as possible. Yeah. I, I think an, another thing that's important too is to, if you ever have questions on these things, um, you know, what the, what the law is and what it means to your organization, reach out to your local state's attorney or your, your parent organization, um, whether it be the Association of Counties or League of Cities, um, School Board Association, they have resources available to help you and, and give you guidance to follow these open, and, open record and meeting guides. Better to ask permission than forgiveness. Definitely. Is there, is there any other questions that you get a lot, Jody, when you um, travel around the state? Yeah, so one thing that's come up a couple of times is the kind of the debate about whether or not um, if you were appointed to be a committee by a public entity, do you have to abide by public meetings and open records laws? And the question has been, well, if I'm a working group, let's say a county commission um, has, um, 
they've created a working group or a special committee to study something. So we don't have to abide by those open records laws. Well, that's not really true. So again, I'll reference the Attorney General's document on Open Meetings Guide. Um, it's actually one of the first, um, first references on this document. If a governing body delegate any authority to two or more people, the newly formed committee is subject to the Open Meetings Law, even if the committee does not have final authority or is just fact-finding, all right? So keep in mind, um, if you're meeting on behalf of an, um, a public organization, you too are subject to those open meeting laws. So again, it goes back to what we just talked about. Be transparent. Um, even if you have nothing to hide and you're sure nobody will care, that's when you get into trouble. So I wonder if I shouldn't just mention too, Andrea, sometimes I know that <clears throat> we've also gotten a discussion um, about whether or not if a quorum happens to be um, at an auction sale or at another public event, is that an open meeting? Yeah, that's a good question. And that, that comes up a lot in, you know, anytime there's a quorum of, a, of an organization present and they're talking about business, then they're actually holding a meeting. Um, the difference there is what they're talking about. So when we have, we still have counties that have only um, three commissioners. So it's not uncommon for, for them to all be in the same place in our small communities. And they can easily have a conversation and not talk about business. But the, the question is, what's the perception to the public when they see three commissioners um, talking to each other? So that gets into the, you know, what's the law? What does the law say? And what's the best practice? And, and what's the, the public perception of, of the discussion? Right. Um, after we had lead local in a community who will remain nameless, someone approached me and said, all of our school board members vacation together. And you know, they may not be breaking the law, and they're probably not talking about public business, but what's the perception? And so, again, small communities, people know each other. We're going to see people at um, public events, maybe a wedding dance or church event or school event and you know when you decide to become a leader and throw your hat in the ring know that you are open to that kind of scrutiny and um and we can't stress enough how important it is just to be aware of the perception that you're you're giving off definitely so we we've talked about the the open meetings a lot um there, there are also some issues that come up with open records. And one right now that's kind of relevant to everything that's happening quickly um, is just the sharing of information and um, how that information is shared. So when you're a public entity, um, and that's an entity that's receiving public funds, you know, you are subject to these open record and meeting laws. And that means that um, the records, any documents you're sharing, are subject to the, the open records. So we have to be careful when we're sharing information back and forth, um, not in the meeting. Um, so texts and emails, um, well that you can set up a time and date for a meeting there, you don't wanna be sharing actual business or having a back and forth discussion about anything business related. So um, don't hit reply all, and uh, group texts aren't, aren't necessarily a good thing unless it just says, our next meeting is this date and time. So Andrea brings up a good point. So I had been referencing the open meetings guide and I'll reference the open records guide and she has the link up there for the attorney general's website. And these are just front and back, really easy to, to um, find kind of reference guides. We use them all the time. So um, definition of a record um, includes all recorded information regardless of physical form paper, email, computer file, photograph, audio tape, recording, text, et cetera. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, there was a, um, a decision on the Attorney General's Office um, homepage in regards to, I think it was the Bismarck Public School, um, and the opinion he had made in that the question was, is some handwritten notes were requested? And 
um, someone had thrown the handwritten notes away and just typed up what had been on the notes. And the attorney general's opinion was that those handwritten notes should have been, um, you know, should have been kept um, with the original meeting documents. So, you know, even if there was no intent to be um, deceptive or malicious, um, just know again to be completely transparent, keep those documents, um, because you just don't know who will ask or request those particular documents. And it's really important to set, to make sure your organization has some conversations about ethics and about the open records and meeting guides. You know, these guides are just a double-sided sheet of paper for um, open records and one for open meetings. So that's something every board member should have. And there's an, also a manual that goes with each of those. And that's a good thing for, for someone to have on file, typically like the secretary or the president. So if you have any questions, it's easy. Um, to go on reference. And then Jody also mentioned, you know, on the Attorney General's website, they have all of their um, opinions on there. So you can go and see um, some questions that have been asked about different organizations and practices and see what their rulings were on them. And so that's a, it's a great resource to utilize. Um, do you have anything else that you wanted to add, Jody? Um, things that have come up over the over time with discussions in communities. We always have some interesting conversations. I think I think the most important thing and we've talked about it a lot is it, your organization needs to have a culture. There's so many entities that we work with who have never had the discussion about ethics. So is it ethical if we put a bid out for a particular construction project? I serve on the board and I also bid the project. Is that ethical? Um, if your board has never had the discussion about whether or not um, we're going to act in an ethical manner, then you're trying to make those decisions when um, it might be too late. So have that discussion. We encourage you to talk about it before you need to. Um, you know, present a, a front of um, unity when it comes to respect and honesty and certainly transparency. And we've talked about that a lot today. So um, if you have questions or you wanna talk about ethical issues in your organization, we have a number of reference materials that we use and um, we welcome your comments on that. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, thank you. Good luck communicating uh, transparency in your organizations. Mm -hmm.